march down to Riverside Cemetery for our Memorial Day ceremonies. We do have a brief ceremony here at our Veterans Memorial. Um, Veterans Memorial is, I don't know how many years old now, 10 or 12 years old. Um, it's a fitting tribute to all who have served from the town of Sunderland on the wall. Um, and there is a bench and a seal for each of the uh, parts of our uh, armed services. So we have uh, with us today um, members of uh, veterans, veterans from Sunderland as well as
Scouts and everyone who's here, and um, thank you all for coming. We lucked out with another beautiful Friday night here in Sunderland for our Memorial Day parade and ceremonies. Um, the first thing that we do when we come here is similar to what we did at the Veterans Memorial. We'll lower the flag to half staff. Okay. Now we'll have the placing of the wreath.
Memorial Day was. There's a history that began back in 1868 when the General John Logan, who was commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, declared that the 30th of May is designated for the purpose of strewing of flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city village and hamlet churchyard in the land. It was done in honor of both Confederate and Union soldiers. It was called Decoration Day beginning um, under General James Garfield, who made a speech at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, and at that point, um, participants that decorated the graves of both Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington Cemetery. It was officially named Memorial Day in 1967 and celebrated on the last Monday of May each year thereafter. The reason I kind of tell you that is a little bit of history, but also because General John Logan is a distant relative of uh, our pastor in town, Reverend Barbara Seaman, who will now come forward and do the invocation. I never take advantage of this moment. I've been doing this for 10 years, but I would like to just offer some, a little lightness to this time. This is a very important holiday for my family. All the male relatives, just about all the male relatives in my family are named Logan. That's how much they thought of this guy that instituted this day because we just tend to forget what's most important, don't we? So I want to just say a quick, this is a joke I've learned I have to tell you when it's a joke. We were walking back from this service a couple years ago and I said, Reverend Ewan, I thank you so much for asking our church to be here. And he said, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but you are the only church in town. <laughs> but many of you don't know this, that we had to have the Congregational Church instituted first before this town could become a municipality, didn't we? So with that, with that, let us pray. Loving God in whom we live and breathe and have our being, hear us as we honor those who through the centuries have given their lives in service to our country. Bestow upon us mercy and grace that we may rightly remember their ultimate sacrifice. Remind us to listen to your guidance of hope and grace that all people may one day live in harmony and peace. Shine your faith through these clouds above. Help us to smile. Help us to give thanks. Be gracious unto us and lift your countenance upon each of us tonight as we remember each name. They shall not grow old as we that are left to grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor years condemn. But as the sun goes down and then rises in the morning, we will remember them. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. We honor our oldest citizen who is a veteran uh, each year during the ceremony. And this year, our oldest veteran is Edgar Raymond Hunt. Please, just step forward. served in the Merchant Marines and in the U.S. Navy from 1943 to 1946. 
returned here to Sunderland and uh, within a year married Edna Warner and they have been on South Main Street and raised their family, um, children, grandchildren and great grandchildren. I don't know if there's any great greats, but there are. I see the heads nodding. Yes, there are. And we are uh, thankful for your service, not only to our country in your military service during World War II, but also your service to the town. I don't know all of the things that you did, but I do know that you were on the Riverside Cemetery and were there at the end of this ceremony. So it's very fitting that we honor you guys. Let's get ready for you. During the past year, uh, six residents who have served in our military uh, passed away, and we usually have a moment of silence for them. John Habby, who served in the Korean War. George Kennedy, who served in peacetime in the U.S. Army. Patrick Kinney, who served in the Korean conflict and in peacetime thereafter in the U.S. Marines. Edwin Nichnicki, who served during World War II in the U.S. Army. James Pelvinus, who served in Vietnam in the U.S. Army. And James Williams, who served during World War II in the U.S. Marine Corps. Let us have a moment of silence in memory of these Sunderland residents who were veterans who passed away during the past year. Thank you. We are lucky this evening to have with us uh, our two state legislators. First of all, I would like to introduce and invite to come and just give brief greetings to you from our new senator, Joe Comerford. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Comerford. I am honored and proud to serve you in the state senate. Uh, up in the Hampshire Franklin Worcester district, which is where we are, uh, and it's 24 cities and towns in the most beautiful valley in the Commonwealth. Uh, yesterday in the State Senate, we recognized the women and men who have given their lives in the service of our nation, and afterwards I spoke with the Senate President, and so I wanted to convey a message from Karen Spilka. I said I was going to the beautiful community of Sunderland that kicks off Memorial Day remembrances in our region, and honors people who have given their lives in the service of our country, and she sends her heartfelt thanks for your service and the love that you bring uh, for these people and their memories, and I'm honored again to join you along with my amazing colleague, Natalie Blay. And she's already been introduced and needs no introduction here in Sunderland. Uh, but our new state rep, that would be quite. I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. This truly is a community event in the town of Sunderland. And Steve Kulik, Rep. Steve Kulik and Senator Stan Rosenberg came here year after year and made this a priority because this memorial service is done so beautifully and it really recognizes the service of so many to our country and to our community. And so I just want to thank you all for making this a priority to be here tonight because this, recognizing the service of so many men and women across our entire nation uh, really means something. And uh, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Each year we recognize the top female and male student in the graduating class at Frontier Regional High School from the town of Sunderland and we ask them to come forward and share a reading uh, appropriate for our Memorial Day ceremonies. This year the top male student from Sunderland is Karsten Carey 
He's been a maximum honor student during his four years of high school. He's a member of the National Honor Society. He's been a member of the varsity cross country team for six years, captain his senior year, uh, the varsity track team for three years, the varsity basketball team for four years, captain his senior year. And he was recognized by the reporter as an area scoring champion uh, the last couple of seasons, I believe. His future plans include a postgraduate year at Deerfield Academy beginning this fall with a concentration in math and science and taking up a new sport, crew or rowing. Quite a change from basketball. He hopes to attend an Ivy League school thereafter. Karsten will come forward now and read for us the Gettysburg Address. The Gettysburg Address is the most famous speech of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln and one of the most quoted speeches in United States history. It was delivered at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on the afternoon of Thursday, November 19, 1863, during the American Civil War, four and a half months after the Union armies defeated those of the Confederacy at the decisive Battle of Gettysburg. In just over two minutes, Lincoln invoked the principles of human equality espoused by the Declaration of Independence and redefined the Civil War as a struggle not merely for the Union, but as a new birth of freedom that would bring true equality to all of its citizens. It is especially fitting that we recite it on Memorial Day as a reminder of the cost of our freedom and equality. Four score, seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent and new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that night. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or to track. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. And the top female student from Sunderland in the graduating class of 2019 at Frontier is Madison Esposito. She has been a maximum honor student during her four years of high school. She is a member of the National Honor Society. She's been a co-president of the Model UN from Frontier. She was selected as a national youth correspondent for the Washington, D.C. Journalism and Media Conference. She has also been editorial consultant and contributor to the literary magazine at Frontier. In her spare time, she takes dance at Pineapple Dance Studio in North Amherst, specializing in jazz, tap, contemporary ballet, competition, and hip-hop. Is there anything else? She is also a member of the wait staff at the Waitley Diner. Her future plans include attendance at the University of Rochester, where she plans to pursue studies in English, history, and psychology. And she will now come forward and read in Flanders Fields. On May 2nd, 1915, in the second week of fighting during the Second Battle of the Lieutenant Alexis Helmer was killed by a German artillery shell. He was a friend of the Canadian military doctor Major Don Craig. It is believed that Mr. Prey began the draft for his famous poem in Flanders Field that evening as he reflected on the death of his friend and the cost of the war. 
In Flanders Field is one of the most quoted poems concerning the ultimate cost of freedoms that we all enjoy in America. It is fitting that we read it during these ceremonies on this Memorial Day weekend. The tradition of wearing red poppies on Memorial Day takes its origin from this well-known and beloved poem. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who died, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. We are indeed fortunate to have these two young people with us, and it is uh, unfortunate that when they go to Frontier from our four towns, they often um, don't ever get recognized really again in their small town. They get recognized at Frontier, um, but they don't often get recognized in the town of Sunday. So we're glad to do that, and we're very happy to both be here this evening. At this time, we'll have a musical medley from the Frontier Regional High School Band, directed by Max Shirell. This time, as is our tradition, we will place a carnation in, when the name is read and the Navy Memorial Bell is rung in honor of one of the 19 Sunderland residents who died in service to their country going back to the French and Indian War. In the French and Indian War in 1722, there were four deceased. Jonathan Bridgman. Samuel Gunn. <laughs> Nathaniel Montague. Eli Scott. In the Revolutionary War, 60 served and there were no deceased. In the 
War of 1812, six served and there were no deceased. In the Civil War, 85 served and there were nine deceased. Charles Blodgett. William Farrell. Edwin Ball. Fred B. Crocker. James Hill. Martin S. Hubbard. John Jones. <coughs> Otis D. Munsell. <coughs> During World War I, 42 served and there were two deceased. Edwin P. Cooley. Antonio Tomasco. During World War II, 161 served, there were three deceased. Lawrence Hubbard Bixby. <laughs> Michael Corpita. Leon Bostic Evans. During the Korean War, 37 men and one woman served. There were no deceased. During the Vietnam War, there was one deceased. Richard C. Graves. I skipped over one in the Civil War. Elliot Puffer. <coughs> this is the roll call of the 19 deceased Sunderland residents who served in our country and died 
in service. Um, we now honor them with a gun salute. Hey! 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 